Thank you. It's a great honour. Thank you, Crystal and Frida. I'm absolutely honoured to be here speaking today. Uh, back in Scotland, I've got a little project, work on a project called Dementia Care of Voices. It's a three-year Scottish Government uh, funded project and it's based in part to harness the campaign that I started from my bedroom. But there, uh, there will be out later if anybody wants any more information. I'm actually here to speak today as a son. Uh, my name's Thomas Whitelaw. And I was a full-time carer for my kind and beautiful and magnificent mum, Joan. My mum passed away on the 22nd of September 2012, and my mum had vascular dementia. And I cared for my mum at home from 2007 until my mum passed away. I came back to visit my mum in 2007, not because of dementia or to become a carer. I was actually coming back for my own reasons. For the 20 years previous, I worked in the music industry and I travelled pretty much 10, 11, 12 months of the year. And I was getting burnt out and disillusioned and, and making quite a few mistakes. But that's the first place you go to when you make those mistakes. You go back to your mum or dad if they're still there. Because they make it better. And they take time to listen. And they help you understand the mistakes that you're making or the path you may have stumbled from. And that's what I was doing in 2007, going back for my mum to do what she'd done so many times before. Put her arms around me and help make it better. But before coming back, people had started to make contact and get in touch to say that they were becoming concerned about my mum, or in their own words, my mum's behaviour. But I just thought my mum's maybe getting a wee bit older, maybe doesn't want to go to some of the places she used to go to, or do some of the things she used to do. But in coming back, things had changed. And they were going to change continually and consistently for the next five and a half years. And when I first came back, it was still for me. I, I decided to take a three or four month break and find out what people's concerns were about my mum and put some things in place and keep a better eye on my mum, even from a distance. But those three months became six months, became nine months, and then a year, and then for the next five and a half years. And within that first year of finding my mum, writing her name on her arm to remind her who she was, and finding scraps of paper in her pocket and under her pillow with my name on it to remind her who the other person in her own house was, there was two of us becoming lost, lonely, and scared. And after the second and the third year, as dementia was doing everything in its power to affect my mum's greatness, Never to me or in my eyes or in my heart, but to affect her greatness. To affect her being recognised as Joan Whitelaw anymore. Too often described at situations or appointments or circumstances we'd been in before. Or that's the wee woman with dementia. Or I'm just here to see the woman. Or where is the wee woman with dementia? But that wee woman had a name and a life and a love story within her and standing holding her hand. And becoming isolated from a community that my mum was born in and grew up in and went to school in and got her first job in and fell in love in and got married in and brought her children up in. There was two of us heading towards the crisis of our lives. In fact, for the last of that third year, I'd wake up and sit in my bed every morning and just sit and cry and think, how are we going to get through today? How do we make it? If we can make it to bedtime tonight, then we've got a chance of making it through tomorrow. But it's not living for anyone in our communities to wake up and think that bedtime's enough. And I got up one day and couldn't do it. Tomorrow felt so far away, we were never going to reach it or touch it or experience it or be included in it or be part of it. And I went out that day to try and get some help, actually from a social work department. And I cried the whole way there holding my mum's hand because I didn't know what to do. And I cried on the bus and walking through the front doors to the reception desk. And asked if someone could please get us the help my mum needed, we deserved, and we are promised. But I was told that day, you can't just walk in here. You have to make an appointment. If you, if everybody, if you look behind you, all those people had the courtesy and the decency to make an appointment before they came in. And we walked out there that day with less chance and less hope and less belief and less understanding and absolutely less kindness than we walked in. 
And that's not why we build them. That's not why there's rooms full of incredible people who get up to work every day to but work in such buildings. I hope we build them to be understanding and take time to listen and at every occasion wrap it up with kindness. It's really important to be kind to the people we live beside, we work beside, we sit in this room beside and every one of us has made a promise that we will care beside. And I had no clue what to do when I got home that day. And one of the things I started doing was writing a wee blog. And I felt better. I felt for the first time I could tell people what it felt like in my heart to feel stupid and lost and alone. And on my blog, I made a promise that if I could get a week's respite, I would walk around Scotland for a week and ask people to write to me and share their experiences, both good or bad, of when someone they loved was diagnosed with dementia. And people wrote to me by the hundreds and the hundreds and now by the thousands and the thousands and the thousands. From Scotland, from England, from Wales, from North America, from Australia, from all around the world. And every single letter that I've received has the word love. So about the day two people met and fell in love and said they would spend the rest of their lives together. But the word love is outmatched and outnumbered by the word loneliness. The word loneliness appears more often and the words isolation appear more often and the words I don't understand what's happening to me or, or we as a family, we don't understand what's happening to us or, or people that we meet. People with really good intentions don't understand who we are, how we feel and who with the right support and encouragement we still have the opportunity to be. And the thing that stands out about the letters that makes them a beautiful letter is about the day you meet that nurse. I'm so glad that nurse walked to my bed today because I feel less scared than I did before I met her. I'm so glad it was that nurse or that care assistant that knocked on my front door today because I feel I know, I understand more than I did before. And it was often the same in the stories and the letters about people on the phone. In every case, it's always been about people and relationships. And no matter what you do or no matter what your role is in this room today, you have the opportunity every single day to transform the lives and the experiences of the people that we care for. What an absolutely incredible gift to have. To wake up one day and think, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a commissioner, I want to be a care assistant, I want to be a doctor. To go out and take all that training and absorb all that knowledge and to help people that live in our communities. But that incredible gift becomes the most beautiful gift when you hand it over to the people who need it most, to the people who are the most vulnerable in our societies. That's where the gift that every one of you in this room has becomes a beautiful gift. And it's always been about people. <clears throat> it was people for the same as us that we met that I sat and thought, I'm so glad you met, I met you today. We were absolutely reaching a crisis. Every, just when we thought we had our way or a routine of getting through each day, we'd wake up and dementia had changed everything. Things that we could do and achieve the day before, we could no longer do them. We had to start from here. And that's where community nursing can play its part at its best. The morning you walk in and say good morning to your mum and she's sitting brushing her hair, and a couple of days later you walk in and she doesn't know how to brush her hair and is never able to do it again, where do you start as a family from that day? Or you walk in and say, how's my mum? And with a smile as wide as the sky, she, she says, how's my big boy today? And two weeks later, you walk in and she screams and asks you, who are you and why are you in my house? And every time those things happen, as families, they leave us helpless and hopeless and lost. And those little things that we've all done today, Every one of us made a decision whether we'd come here by train or by car or by bus or we'd walk. We've made a decision about what we'd like to wear. We've decided who we'll sit beside and we'll decide who we have lunch with at the break. And when those decisions start disappearing from your life or taken away from you, that's when you get left feeling helpless and hopeless and lost. I got up one morning to give my hard-working mum her breakfast and medication. And my mum had had an accident in her bed. And it was that quick. In one overnight sleep, my mum was doubly incontinent. And I knew it was forever. I'd spent four and a half years always watching things being forever. 
And I really didn't know what to do. Before that, we stumbled through it. When my mum went to the bathroom, I would sit against the bathroom door and talk her through how to do it. And when she needed more help, I'd go in with her, but always looking in the other direction. So I wouldn't see anything she wouldn't like me to see. When my mum got up in the morning, I would put her clothes out in the order she wore them. And when she needed more help to get dressed and undressed, I would help her do it, but always looking in that direction so I wouldn't see her naked. Because how would my mum feel about that? How would any of us feel about someone seeing us in such a private and intimate and personal position? And I hope as nurses that's a question you take towards every bed you walk towards and every door you knock on. How do you feel about me doing that for you today? Are you okay with me doing that to you today? If we just do it because someone's told us that we're in a hurry and it's okay for us, maybe we've just failed the person we've done it for. I hope you keep it in your heart. But I just wanted my mum back at her best that day. So all my mum ever tried to do was get up every day and work hard to do the best she could for her family, her friends and her neighbours. And the only thing I could think of doing was if I got the bath and I filled it up with enough bubbles and I kept my eyes closed, I'd be able to undress my mum and wash her and I wouldn't see anything she wouldn't like me to see. And we stumbled through it with all these questions. Am I doing the right thing? Am I hurting my mum? What would my mum say to me today if she could still speak? And I got my mum in the bath and I got her favourite shampoo that day because I wanted my mum's hair to smell beautiful. And I knew that if my mum could reach her own hand out, she'd have picked her favourite shampoo. When I first came back to visit and stay with my mum, we used to go to the shops together and she would fill her basket up with things she'd been putting in there for the last 20 years of her life. They were part of her life story. And when my mum could no longer go to the shops, I made sure I picked them up every Saturday because they were important to her. And I got my mum in the bath and I got her out with her nice pyjamas on and her hair the way she liked it and, 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 and her bed all ready and sat down in her sitting room in absolute despair. Out of the good days and the bad days, this was a dreadful day of trying to care for my mum. Out of the days we smiled and the days we cried are the things that made us feel safe or the things that made the nights so long and so scary. This was a dreadful day of how do we get through this. And I called up that day to try and get some help from an incontinence nurse. But I was told it's June and two are off sick and two are in holiday and you're not the only person who needs help today. And where as a society do we fit the word dignity into such a question and answer for our mums, our dads and our brothers and our sisters? I was then told if we wanted help sooner I should call at 8 o'clock every morning and complain and they'd kind of get fed up with us and push us up the queue. But I refused to do that because my mum wasn't a cheat. And I had to base my decisions on the life my mum led and the person she was. After all, this was my mum's life. But that resulted in us waiting day after day after day and I could be here for a while for someone to come. And every time my mum had an accident we went through the same routine of my tears and the questions and my eyes closed in the bubbles. And I phoned the GP to tell him of our predicament that we were still waiting for someone to come. And at first he tried to tell me the same story about a shortage and I told him I didn't want to hear that today. Could he just find one person that could pass by and help us get through this? I didn't even want them to do it for us anymore. I just wanted to know that what I was doing was okay. And he said he would get a district nurse to come out on the Thursday at one o'clock to give us tips and advice and make sure my mum was safe. And I knew she was coming at one o'clock and I thought I'll get my mum already in the bath at half twelve so she's beautiful for this nurse coming. Because when I was a wee boy, I got flung in the bath before we went to the hospital or the doctors. You had to be at your best. And I knew that if my mum was going to the hospital for a nurse, she would want to be the best she could. But I also wanted when that district nurse came in and under, to, leaned over to undress my mum, that she would smell her beautiful hair. And she would think, every time I meet you, Joan, your hair must smell beautiful. And every time I walk out this house, your hair must smell beautiful. I wanted to set a standard with the right support and encouragement we could achieve for the last few months in my mum's life. 
And while the bar was bathing, my mum, the door went and the district nurse had arrived. And I shouted downstairs to say, I'm holding my mum, can you just please come up the stairs? And as she came walking up those stairs, I cried louder than I've ever cried in my life before because I wanted her to know what it felt like from my heart to feel stupid and lost and alone. And she came walking into our bathroom and at first never said a word. She just took a look at the two of us. She then put her arms around my shoulder and told me I was doing a great job of looking after my mum. And I felt better the second she said that I felt I can do this and we might get through this. She then knelt down very quietly and introduced herself to my mum and she showed me how to lift my mum and she showed me how to wash my mum and she showed me how to dry my mum like a lady. Because I'm sure my mum always dried herself like a lady when she was able to do that for herself. She then said, I'm going to put this in place and that in place and I'm going to organise this bed that you've got a wee button that moves up and down and I'm, and I'm going to do all these things. And 45 minutes later, as she was walking down her stairs to leave, she turned around and said, and I'm going to come here every Friday morning just to make sure the two of you are okay. One of the most beautiful sentences I've ever said, heard in my life, because we mattered. As she, as she walked up those stairs, we were lost and alone and falling apart. And 45 minutes later, when she walked back down them, we were less alone and back on a path to get through this. And I have to tell you something about her. She didn't even realise what she'd just done. She was just being a great nurse. Because I think that's what great nurse, district nurses, queen's nurses, care assistants, whoever you may be, I think that's what you do. You walk in and you meet people when they're at their most vulnerable in one way or another. You put a hand around their shoulder and you help them understand. And if I saw that district nurse today, I would cross the street and tell her thank you for doing that for my mum. And if I saw her again tomorrow, I would cross the street and I would shake her hand again and I would tell her thank you for making our lives better. And I hope you are that district nurse. I hope that's why you're here today. I hope it's who you were to the people whose beds you sat beside yesterday, whose front doors you knocked on or you spoke to on the phone. I hope it's who you want to be today and I truly hope it's who you want to be tomorrow. Because the biggest difference two and four for the care of the people in our communities that need it comes from the people sitting in the seats in this room today. This is a room full of people who can change people's lives every single time they sit by their bed, they knock on their door, or they speak to them on the phone. And I celebrate every single one of you for being that nurse. Okay, five. I'm going to finish really quickly, and just because so many people have written to me, I'm going to read a very short letter out very quickly. And then I'm going to tell you a wee bit about my mum so you don't just think about dementia and continence. She was much greater than that. And dementia didn't define my mum, but it played a part in her life. This is a really short letter out of the thousands that people have sent me. It says, Dear Tommy, I'm writing to see if there's anything can be done to help me. I am 80 years of age and my husband is almost 77 and he has vascular dementia and our life is very tough. As I said, I'm finding it tough and there is no one to share or help me get through this. I feel so low at times and so very, very lonely. I need a human, listening, understanding ear. None of my friends or family seem to understand what we are going through. But you see, we have been married for 53 years. Such a beautiful marriage. But I'm losing my marriage and my husband. Can you come and help me? And at no point in that letter does that lady ask for a miracle. She doesn't even ask for a cure for dementia. She asks for something that every one of us can be. A human, kind, understanding ear. But there's something absolutely beautiful about that letter. We have been married for 53 years. The two people in that letter met 57 and a half years ago and fell in love and have been together every single day. And everyone in this room and everyone that we meet has a unique and remarkable life and love story. And I know who she'd love to meet. She'd love to meet that district nurse that came in my house because she'd put her arms around her shoulder. And I truly hope she'd love to meet every single one of you. 
Because after she met you, she would never have to write such a letter of loneliness again. So I'm going to finish very quickly and just tell you very briefly about my mum. I'm really honoured and thank you for the chance to come and speak today as a son. My mum's name was Joan Whitelaw. She was born on the 15th of the 7th, 1939. My mum's mum died when she was four and her dad passed away when she was seven. And my mum's big sister, who was quite a bit older and went on to have eight children of her own, took my mum in and cared for her. She put her arms around her and told her, I will care for you, I will protect you, I will keep you safe, I will keep you from fear. And if anybody ever asks me, what does caring sound like? I think that's what it sounds like. I'll be there for you. And if you're ever scared, I'm going to hold your hand. And that was the building blocks that made my mum a remarkable lady. I was really lucky to be her son. My mum couldn't stop caring for and about everyone she met. She knew how important it was. Then my mum went out and went to school and one of her first jobs was a trainee seamstress. And normally I show one of my films with my mum, a photo of my mum in her wedding dress. And she had absolutely no money. And she made that wedding dress with her own hands and she looked absolutely beautiful. And I think that's part of my mum's love story. I fell in love one day and I had no money and I made my own wedding dress and I looked lovely. And my mum met my dad, her only ever boyfriend, his only ever girlfriend. And that's the greatest love story of all, when two people meet one day and fall in love for the rest of their lives. And after my dad passed away, I thought my mum was going to die of a broken heart because she just missed him that much. And this will be a room full of love stories like that that we've met people and we will lose them at hearts for heart every single time we think of them. And my mum gave her children everything and took nothing for herself. And this room will be full of love stories like that. But that's where our love story ends. That's when I came back to care for my mum and I couldn't keep, her, keep it going. I couldn't keep her safe and I couldn't keep her from fear. But it's also a really short description of my mum's life. Everybody in this room now knows a little bit about Joan Whitelaw. But everybody in this room now knows, knows more about my mum than most of the people involved or made the decisions about her care for the last five and a half years of her life. And if we don't know who people are, if we have no clue who people are and who they have been and who we can help them be, if we don't know what makes someone smile or stops them from being sad or makes them feel safe or stops them from being scared, can we truly say we cared for that person? I'm not sure we can. But if we do, if we take time to find out those little things, but really massive things from the people that we care for, if we find out who they have been and who they are and who we can help them be, then we are that district nurse. But more importantly, we're part of the greatest story of all. We're part of someone's love story. And every single one of us, even on a good day, needs a little bit of help to keep our love stories going. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for caring for people yesterday. Thank you for doing it again today. And I ask you to get up again and do it again tomorrow. But I just ask you as a son, Find out about the life and the love stories of the people that you care for. If you do, there's a chance it could change your life. But I guarantee you one thing, it will give you the tools and the opportunities to change the lives of the people that you care for. Thank you very much.